fight for Florida. This is the start of making sure we're getting back into the game. Democrats down in numbers make a million dollar investment. State of Florida is headed in the, literally the right direction. Republicans have the math and the majority. The state of Florida has become the Republican state for the entire country. Black history up close and firsthand. Americans don't want the government telling professors what they can and cannot teach. It is un-American. Florida's new curriculum in the crosshairs. What we see right now, it's become increasingly restrictive. Uh, it has injected ideology as opposed to education. We had a duty to act to protect the public from this dereliction of duty. The governor suspends another top prosecutor. I am your duly elected state attorney for the Ninth Judicial Circuit, and nothing done by a weak dictator can change that. Punishment or politics? The big news of the week and the roundtable all live this week in South Florida. Good Sunday morning, I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin today with a million dollar question. Will that million help move the needle for Florida Democrats? The party is two weeks into a state tour aimed at registering voters, the most basic part of building a party. Florida Republicans closed the gap and racked up numbers over the last decade and now have well over half a million voters as advantage. That led to a near sweep that makes Florida state government solidly conservative. And that led to Florida being a, if not the, leading state for what they call culture war legislation. Nikki Freed became chair of the Florida Democratic Party six months ago and is leading the charge in a new kind of fight mode. Nikki Freed joining us via Zoom today, live from, I don't know where you're live from. Nikki, where are you now? <laughs> You've been I'm everywhere. actually home this weekend, so I'm in uh, Tallahassee. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome to the show. Um, you know, it, permit me to say Florida Democrats have been in defense mode for a year, maybe more, maybe two. Um, and now I guess this might be the new aggressive stance. Is that valid? Absolutely. And I think you're right. And the people of our state know this. You know, Florida Democrats completely collapsed last year. Everything from lack of investment from both our, our statewide apparatus, our national partners. And we saw a 19 point loss for Florida Democrats because that's what it was, a complete collapse. And so when I took over the end of February, I said, we are going to be doing this differently. We're going to be showing up into our communities. We're going to be fighting to take our state back. We're going to every part of our state to create this energy that hasn't been here in the party apparatus. And so you heard uh, that we made a $1 million commitment. Uh, and that's what started off our, our Take Back Florida tour on voter registration because we, too, have been seeing this gap. And so we have to make sure that we're going into our communities year round organizing, energizing our base, because we've seen the most egregious policies coming out of Tallahassee that has taken our state in such a drastic right winged position, which is not who we are as Floridians. Florida has always been the middle of the road. We've always been more libertarian. And this aggressiveness from the Republican Party and the extreme agenda is having a toll on the people on our ground. We have a huge economic uh, downfall right now. The largest inflation in the nation is right here in the state of Florida. And of course, property insurance is top of minds of everybody in our state. So Florida Democrats are going to be aggressive. We're going to be fighting back and we're going to make sure the people of our state know exactly what Democrats stand for and who we fight for. All right. So before before we get into all of the the talking points of it all and the messaging of it all, which is which is critical for for everybody who has a message, I, I want to just point out that it sounds like you're taking a page out of the GOP handbook. I mean, that's exactly what Florida Republicans have been doing and and it's worked for them. So so where do you go with that? Is this like a head on battle, you know, mano a mano? I'm ready for that battle every day of the week because, look, it's the people of our state that we all fight for. And when you are talking about, you know, the right wing extremism that's coming from the Republicans, 75 percent of our state did not want a six week abortion ban. Regardless if you personally have personal beliefs against abortion, it's about making sure that government is not overreaching and having those conversations inside of your doctor's office with you. Then 71% of our state did not want permitless and trainless care, open carry here in our state, yet the Republicans did it anyhow, the anti-immigration bill. So we have a lot of really important issues. And of course, the assault on, on our on our economic, on our um, economy, but our assault also on our academics. 
Um, right now, as you know, education is a top of mind of so many Floridians as we're going back to school. Palm Beach was last week. I believe Dade County is this week. Highest teacher shortage in the nation. Um, school boards don't know exactly what classes to teach, which classes not to teach, AP psychology in or out, uh, the attacks on, on Black history, and, and of course, um, you know, removing of our books all over our state. That's not who we are as Floridians. That's not where we are. So we are going to be aggressive. So we are me, going to be okay. our community. Let me just, um, you bring up some really interesting math. So, so sort of calculate this for me. The, the numbers that you just cited factually about the abortion, six week abortion ban is, is not a popular thing in the population. And yet I was in Tallahassee when it was passed, it was a two to one thing it, in the Florida legislature. So what you're talking about in the halls that make policy and make law, there is a two to one conservative majority put there by Florida voters. So how do you, how do you reconcile that math? It's a couple of things. You know, again, if you actually had the turnout in 2022 that we typically have in a gubernatorial election, like in 2018, one million Democrats did not show up in the 2022 election, including add that to the amount of our third party, our NPAs, no party affiliates that also stayed home. And so when you see such a mass exodus from the polls, that is what has resulted in a supermajority in both the House and the Senate, uh, the, the sweep all of, of all four cabinet okay, positions. But, but why? Why? Why did people stay home? Well, it was a couple of things. You know, first of all, you know, Ron DeSantis had a significant amount of war chest. Democrats did not. Um, there, there was not a, a lack. There was a lack of energy from the candidates, um, a lack of a platform. You know, what exactly was Democrats, you know, selling? in 2022 I, you know even to this day I, I don't have an answer for that you know we weren't putting the work on the ground we weren't doing year-round organizing and so people just felt well why would i come out and vote um you know one party is the same as the other and so people stayed home and that's what uh, equated to and of course the, the tremendously large gerrymandering uh, of our of our of our districts um we're seeing that the, the congressional maps there was a deal on friday it looks like uh the congressional map of, up in the panhandle where al lawson was maybe coming back to the Democrats and having a, a new a drawn seat because Governor DeSantis came in like we've never seen before and drew those congressional maps. We've never seen a governor come in and now he's going to be losing in the courts. But the seats have been gerrymandered and, and you can see that all over the maps. And so that is where Democrats are going to have to fight back. We're going to have to fight back in the margins. We know that our third parties right now are close to almost a third of our electorate. And the Democrats not just need to talk to Democrats. We need to be talking to independents. And of course, the policies that we talk about, the economy, um, the environment, education, those aren't issues that are just solely Democrats. Women's right to choose, um, permitless carry, those are not Democratic issues. Those are issues that affect everybody in our state. And we didn't have a cohesive message in 2022. You better believe we're going to have it in 24. So that's it. Let's get back to that messaging now, because that is critical. And, I, you know, we as journalists always tell people, don't listen to the talking points, look beyond, drill down, do firsthand. But we know that talking points and messaging is critical in an election. And the Republicans had that as early as 2018. And I think anyone on the street can tell you anti-woke is a Republican message. And there are a lot of people who you, you can't ignore that a significant number of voters don't want to be whatever they consider woke. And then there was uh, in 2018, socialism. That word resonates, especially in South Florida, with so many people who don't want to be socialist. Not that anyone ever would be or government ever would be, but that was a very clear, very convincing message. What did Democrats do to combat something like that? We didn't, and that's where you saw the, the losses. There was no combat. You know, when we were labeled socialists, let me also be very clear. You know, as somebody who grew up in Miami, somebody who, who heard the stories of my back neighbors who fled uh, communist Cuba, that we understand why so many Floridians and, and that left their, their South American homelands um, to come here to our state and to our country for democracy, for freedom, for liberties. 
And they come here and, and I can tell you, I would never, ever let our government go into a direction that would take away those rights and those liberties. But unfortunately, that's what the Republicans are doing. You know, they're, they're making it harder for people to have that American dream. They're, they're making it harder for, for our teachers to teach. They're going into our classrooms. They're going into um, our, our doctor's offices and our hospitals. That They're going into the very personal decisions that are being made every single day. And they're not doing anything to actually fix the economy. We're at 9% inflation, the highest property insurance rates in the country. So while they've been dealing with these culture wars and dividing our state, the everyday working Floridian, the people that have lived here for generations or the people that have come here to retire can't afford to live here anymore. So the message for Democrats is the same message for the everyday Floridian in our state. The culture wars are hurting our, our academics, they're hurting our environment, they're hurting our economy, and, and it's time to fight back and, and give the people of our state back their state, because unfortunately, the, the MAGA extremism is hurting our state. And so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be having a cohesive message, fighting against the messaging that has been on us. And what are the Republicans saying right now? That our liberal agenda, I, I mean, that's the best they've got. And the reality is, is that the people of our state are tired of this. In fact, again, Ron DeSantis is underwater in our state. He has flipped, flipped to under 55, under 50%, close to about 46% of favorability. If he had an election today, he would lose. These cultural wars do not work and are having huge impacts on our kids, on our teachers, on our families, on, on our immigrant populations. And that has to stop. And that's what Democrats are going to be presenting for the 24, a cohesive message, fighting back for our economy, fighting back for our educational system, and fighting back for the everyday working person of our state. And fighting in the margins, which I feel like every single Florida election somehow is in the margins, right? <laughs> Nikki Freed, yes. great to see you. Thank you for your time today. Yeah. And uh, check in. We want to be on top of things as we march toward 2024. Thank you. Take care. All right, and up next, the debate and the debrief. We take this to the round table. Stay tuned. We are talking voter numbers and we're taking it right to the round table. So some introductions first. L'Oreal R. Scott chairs the Miami-Dade County Independent Civilian Panel and is past president of both the Wilkie D. Ferguson Bar Association and the Gwen Cherry Women's Lawyer Association. Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. Anne Gegis is a South Florida-based journalist reporting statewide for Florida politics. Rafael Yanis is a Miami-based attorney and a consummate political analyst and a veteran of the roundtable. And veteran of the roundtable, Mary Lee Cancio, attorney, Republican analyst, and so deep in the weeds with Miami-Dade Republican politics. So guess who gets the first question? <laughs> <laughs> so Mary Lee, first of all, great to have you and great to have you back. Thank and you. Um, thank you for having us. Of thank course. You. First time in over three years in person. COVID really, is, yeah. I know it's Little not break. over, but for here it's free, yes. COVID free space. Um, let, let me hear your um, sort of reaction to what you heard. Nikki, Nikki Freed of all Florida statewide ch Democratic chairs, she's, um, you know, she's out there and she, that's how she is. She's a natural sort of assertive, aggressive, energetic, like the party has not had before. Tell me. Well, I think yeah, the me. Democratic Party needed that, right? Yeah. Because the numbers show how the Republican Party now has a lead of almost 600,000 voters. We've seen from 2022 to 2023 how m instead of for six years, people wanted to register at independence. From 22 to 23, we had a shift to the Republican Party. Although independents are still almost 4 million people. Almost 3.9 million people. Yeah. But, but we saw from 22 to 23 that f was a first year that we didn't get an increase in independence. Actually, the number went down. Huh. And we've seen how some of those voters went to the Republican Party. And so when they talk about the state of Florida being in shambles because of this governor, I think that it's so wrong and misleading. Florida's number one in the country for education. Like it or not, number one. Don't let, believe let me just Google. Jump I don't think that's true. Google it. That's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not about opinion. It's about facts. Florida, facts. Florida lags. Florida right. lags on statewide standards that mm -hmm. are tested. You know, we have a phrase in Spanish that the paper holds all the ink that you put on it. Mm -hmm. So when the Republican Party comes out and says exactly what you just said, yeah. 
I it wasn't the Republican back. Party. It was Google. You can Google yeah, it. Yeah, Google, Google on mm -hmm. Republican Party fed sources and uh -huh. pay to play sources. The problem is education is Look. in shambles. Hold on, hold on. Education is in shambles in Florida, Marie Lee, because you have all these edicts being sent out from Tallahassee on a culture war from the governor who's trying to save his campaign that is in shambles right now. Rafael, and that's that's no, the root of the I problem. Disagree. Can, I, can I just bring in, I, I just want to bring in, Anne is a statewide reporter. And I, I want to get sort of the objective view well, of that. The real question when I hear that people are saying it's number one in the country, the best education system, then you have to ask yourself, why is he going to war with it in terms of, you know, accepted norms like the AP psychology and, you know, other classes and other, you know, just... Uh, you, teacher books and all kinds of things. There's no reason for... Um, um, I, I actually, I think I know what you're talking about. U.S. News and World Report put out, uh, they put out every year a whole list of education um, analysis. Mm -hmm. Florida was number one in a very specific category of education, not education overall. And I think that's where the governor takes that number and brings it into the I'm not point. reading the number Let's from the governor. Course. I actually looked it up this morning because I really wanted to be right when I ranks number one in education. And I'll tell you, I served seven years as a trustee at Miami Day College, the most diverse college in the United States. Yes. And what we've done about affordability, about education in this state for minority students, it's incredible. So I don't appreciate anybody coming and saying, oh, well, on the floor, that really our schools are not that good. Why is it that we're the number one let's, state in the country of people moving in here? Then why is he making such to pains make it to better. change it? Let's to make why it Why is better. he going to work with a war with and things like diversity, equity, Today in the Herald. And, and Today in the Herald. First page of the Miami Herald. The, the whole thing was how horrible it was, people are going back to school, how we're banning books. I turn around after reading the article, ask my husband, honey, how many books do you think were banned in Miami, Dade, and Broward? He said, one. I said, no, none. No books were banned. Some books were it's restricted. It's a semantic issue. They have restricted yeah. books. You. Yes. Exactly. To, at, when from parents certain grade complain, levels. those yes. books disappear exactly. from the bookshelves. From elementary so school to middle school. Are we restricting books? Oriel, in the mix. Yes. Go, so, go, girl. <laughs> right. I mean, I love the lively discussion. I, you know, welcome to the round table. But what's misleading and what's misguided is this idea of a cultural war. So I love that Nikki Freed hit on the Democrats have to do a better job with uh, the, the messaging, right? Spot on. And we've been saying that for many, many years. The Democrats need to listen to their constituents and they need to tune up the message. So let's talk about that message. What does anti-woke mean anyway? And that's something that you hinted at, Glenna. Anti-woke, first of all, if anything, is actually moving everyone to the side of those of us who are woke. So let's talk about woke. Woke means being Re reclaim. aware. Reclaim the message. We're reclaiming like the message. Woke means being aware of the social injustices around you, awakening to the world around you. So when DeSantis is attacking the woke agenda, he's basically telling everyone to go to sleep to the realities that face us. But the problem is that he, he what feeds DeSantis and Republicans that are going against the woke mob and Florida's anti-woke according to their messaging is because they hook on to the extreme examples. And that's that's the struggle that I and, have and with fears. folks. But what are and the, and fears. those extreme examples? Even when we discuss it, we're giving credibility to their argument because there are no extreme examples. The reality about what slavery meant in America, the reality about what it means to be women in well, America. We'll be talking about that as, as the show continues as well. You, you know what, before we run out of time, and there, uh, Nikki mentioned something that I hadn't thought of that I thought was very interesting, and that is the gerrymandering of the state. And, you know, to, to the victor go the spoils. I mean, Republicans Certainly. got to draw the lines, and they did. And how, how brilliant did they draw the lines? Or was it? Well, it might have gone too far, I'd say. It seems like the Supreme Court is having something of a backlash about the extent to which it has done. It's focused on others. They've focused on other states, but we've heard that Florida's time is coming, that they might get the map thrown out. And they've said a pathway has been created to get one of the um, black oriented districts back in the mix for 2024 so it could be happening sooner th rather than later so but that would be a congressional district but what about the, the state lines I mean the, for the the districts mm -hmm. for 
the state, state yes. when you, state legislature. when a voter goes and votes for a state senator or a state rep, and that's where the laws of the state are made. I mean, Mary Lee, that's those those lines are really favoring a Repu another Republican vote. Look, we have what a constitutional amendment against gerrymandering. You know. districts, Florida. So I I will trust the court to make the decision on that. Brenda, to your point, there's in political science, there's cracking and packing. So you crack a demographic and split it up so that you can dilute their power. You pack together a demographic that you want to get. That, that's a true a truth amongst both parties. And so is it cracked and packed already? Well, the, the legislature, Republican-dominated legislature, has been cracking. And then there's backroom deals cut where they pack in to protect certain interests. So crack and pack will be the message line for our I next like memo. I'm making my <laughs> University of Florida poli sci professors proud, hopefully this morning. All right, so um, we are going to be back in just a little while, but first, next, for you to see, and for you to see the debate over Florida's black history curriculum really did ramp up this week in the fight over facts and context. A firsthand tour is underway for teachers right now, and we are getting on that bus. Stay tuned. Right now, a bus filled with Miami-Dade teachers is on the way back from immersing in Florida history, specifically African-American Florida history, learning firsthand about racist atrocities black citizens endured a century ago in Ocoee and in Rosewood. The tour is led by professor, author, and South Florida historian Marvin Dunn. Few people know black history in Florida as intimately, and few have been more outspoken against the new Florida standards than Dr. Dunn. Marvin Dunn, great to see you. What, you're, where are you? You're in the forest somewhere? We are in Rosewood, Florida. We are on the Dunn property, five acres of undeveloped land in Rosewood. And I'm here with 30 Miami-Dade County teachers supported by the UTD and my own nonprofit, the Miami Center for Racial Justice. We just got here about an hour ago and we're walking the railroad track that was used to evacuate some of the black people during the massacre in 1923. In Rosewood, and we will talk about that in just a minute, part of the tour that uh, you've been doing these tours for, for years. I think you might have stopped at one point, but, but is this tour, I mean, what's different about this? Is this ramping up again as a, a backlash, an antidote, a response to the debate over the new African-American history standards? Yes, this tour is different because there are teachers here with me this time. I normally bring high school, high school students and their parents or grandparents, but this is a tour for Miami-Dade County teachers, and we're here to impress upon these teachers the truth about Rosewood and about Okoe, where we were yesterday, so that they don't pass on the lies that the state standards now want them to teach, that there are black people who, who committed racial violence against white people in Rosewood and in Okoe. Did not happen. These teachers are here to learn the truth. I'm so grateful that they're here. And so I want to dig into a little bit uh, about exactly specifically that, because there are really two things that have really been under debate in these standards. One of them is a line in the middle school curriculum about how enslaved people developed skills that might be used for their own personal benefits, and we talked so much about that. And the other one, to your point, is when discussing the massacres, racist massacres, a century ago in Ocoee and Rosewood, the line is about learning about violence against and by African Americans. And to your point, the historic record shows there was no violence by African Americans in Ocoee nor Rosewood, that they were the victims of that. And, and I wonder if the language, rather than the sentiment, the language is really what the issue is here, because nothing's been taught yet. There, there has been no practical lessons taught yet. What do you think about that? It's both the language and the sentiment. There's no place in Florida history that I know of where black people committed racial violence against whites. And the state of Florida is telling our teachers to equivocate the history of racial violence in Florida. Everybody was doing it. Blacks did it, whites did it, and it did not happen. Mr. Sylvester Carey, who was the hero of Rosewood, defended his family by killing two of the mob members who came onto his porch. And that's now considered anti-white violence by blacks. We're here to set the record straight. The state of Florida does not want to face up to the violent history 
of race in Florida. And we're here to teach these teachers the truth. And Dr. Dunn, why do you think that is? I mean, there, you know, we know many of the people who wrote the standards, who are overseeing the standards, many of them, a significant number of them are African-Americans. Why, why would Florida educators want to sugarcoat or whitewash? Why would they want to do that? Why? What would because that intention a, be? Because it's a very, very violent history. And the fact that they have these few black Republicans, these extremist black Republicans, one of whom said Jews own everything, one of whom said, I'm, I thank God for slavery. I could have been in Africa worshiping a tree. These are folks that DeSantis is listening to on his, well, his black scholars. He's not listening to us. He's listening to his hand-picked extremist Republican black members of the, of the, of the party. What do you think, you know, the, we've reported on these standards for weeks now. There's elementary, there's middle, there's high school. In the elementary school curriculum, there is no discussion of enslaved people or slavery. There is a curriculum about great African Americans in Florida history. Um, and that, that got me to wondering, what do you think is the right age to, for, for kids, for students, to learn about atrocities and horrors and racism like that? I think by middle school, most kids are able to handle this. Think about what they have on TikTok available to them. Mm. So middle school, but I'm concerned about lower grades. Right now we got this Prager University, ultra right uh, organization offering videos to kids, to the schools that teach Columbus was telling the slaves, telling people that it was better to be enslaved than to be killed. Columbus is telling that uh, to current day kids on a video by Prager University. That's the kind of thing that we're opposed to. We want the truth taught, not a slanted one way version. I don't know if you've been able to see a letter that had been written by one of the people who was on that work group who wrote the curriculum. Um, I'm, I'm just going to guess by his name. He's a social studies teacher. He's a veteran. He's a father. I'm guessing he's Hispanic uh, just by his name. And he had Rob, Roberto Fernandez is his name. He wrote a letter to the Department of Education, to Manny Diaz, the Secretary of Education, asking to revisit, being actually very complimentary of the work that he and his colleagues have done, uh, very proud of the work, but saying it needs to be made better uh, in response to this obvious outcry and disgust and horror by so many people, recommending that the work group go back and make it better. Would you advocate for that? No, not that crowd. No, 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 no. Go back and make it better, but don't use those stooges. Don't use those Republican hand-picked extremists. No, 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 no. Go back and revisit, but get people who have the capacity to give the input that the state needs right now in this crisis. And that's not those folks that DeSantis put on this committee, on that workforce group, as he called it. You know, the last time we were together on this program, it was before the standards were written. It was like uh, last year, I want to say. And, and it was, uh, the state was, and the legislature was forming some of the rules that framed the guidelines for why these new curriculums were curricula were written and you had said then that you wouldn't do one thing to change one word one thought one iota of the things you've been posting to the governor about your own black history and your family's history and i wonder if you've ever gotten a response from the governor or from the education department or anybody I wrote the governor and Manny Diaz a letter months ago asking what am I going to be allowed to teach or not teach to my university colleagues that I'm training in black history. Never got a response from either person. I was so disappointed that Manny Diaz canceled his appearance in Miami because I wanted to ask him some of those questions. The governor never responded to anything I've sent to him. A lot of people would like to hear them respond for sure. Dr. Marvin Dunn and the group of teachers behind you in the woods. This might be one of the coolest live remotes we've had on no, This Week in South so Florida. <laughs> and uh, hi, yes. everyone. And I'm really appreciative that you all stopped for us to do this. And we'll uh, safe trip home. Thank you. See Take you. Care. All right. And next up for us, the round table weighs in. We 
are back with the Power Roundtable to weigh in on what you just heard. I would like uh, L'Oreal or Scott, I'm going to guess among us, you have the most personal attachment to what you heard Marvin Dunn on the tour uh, and the uproar over these standards and, and many, many people who in this state are fine with the standards as well. And there is that debate. And I would like you to weigh in on, on what you heard. So I think Professor Dunn is spot on. I, I'm not clear on why there is such a discomfort with us candidly having a conversation about history and about Florida's history. You know, Professor Dunn is reporting live from uh, Rosewood, one of the major atrocities that African Americans in the state of Florida face. What's important is that we learn from our history so that we can never repeat it and so that we understand our current state. It's unclear to me why there are several attempts to whitewash that history. It makes folks feel uncomfortable. How do you think the descendants of the enslaved folks feel? You know, I want to dig into that word uncomfortable and guilty because, Anne, this curriculum was written specifically because there is a new state law which specifically says the curriculum or, or education, I don't want to verbatim it, it's not in front of me, but shouldn't make students feel guilty or feel inferior. The, the law mandates that. It's called the Stop Woke Act, and when it was introduced last year, nobody really, it was very vague, yeah. and no one really understood what it would mean in practice. And I think what we're seeing is sort of the practical rules that are following up on that mandate that nobody feel uncomfortable or guilty because of their race. And part of that law is currently in federal appeals court. If they've been stopped from enforcing it which, in- Which part? Um, the part that- was, I think that was for the business training? Was no, that... this was for the university part. Uh -huh. And it's, they said it, you know, that was the, Judge Walker's famous part about, you know, this is really extreme, you know. That was the quote. Yeah, the, right. that, that was a quote that made it out. So the Stop Woke Act has been partially stopped. It's going through the appeals process. But Glenda, to your point, on the drive here, I was speaking to a high school history teacher who happens to be African-American. I was asking her, how do you feel about all these issues that are going on and the history being rewritten, the debate, and she said that she wanted to go to the education event hosted by uh, Sen Senator Chevron Jones Thursday. in Miami Gardens on Thursday that uh, the education commissioner, Manny Diaz Jr., had confirmed that he would attend, last minute pulled out. She said she wanted to go with wearing two hats, one as an educator, because how she wants some professional guidance and understand she wanted no disrespect to the media, but she wanted to hear directly <laughs> from the education commissioner without idea? any filtering, without any okay. sound bites. And then she said she wanted to also be there as a mother, uh, as, as somebody whose history is being debated. And she impacted my analysis of the situation very deeply because she was explaining when she talks to her kids about what happened at school, they say, but my teacher said. Mm -hmm. And then she now finds herself in a position of having to kind of contradict or re-educate her kids from of a family history, a lived history, and then what they're being taught in school. Combating TikTok and combating what my teacher said is the hardest thing for parents these days. On, and, on, on every issue. In every, in every issue. issue. The I, only thing that I disagree with Professor Dunn, respectfully pr Professor Dunn, uh, I believe you need to start talking to your children about this nation's history from before they reach middle school. TikTok is taking over and is educating yeah. our kids on all topics, especially the same issue that for some reason we're attempting to dummy down. But, but, but I disagree. I disagree. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I disagree yeah. with that because these standards did not show up from one day to the other. They were developed. There were meetings. There were discussions. There were at least five meetings where the union was present. They didn't make any comments. They didn't make any recommendations. For 90 days after they were written, they were put up and said, okay, give us public comments. Zero, nothing. This whole debate, two parts. They want to attack the governor and a very unfortunate clause, the one that says that uh, they could get some personal benefit from some of the skills they had learned. If it wasn't for that, if you actually read the curriculum, we they're learning know. about a COE, they're learning about different things. People read headlines but about many ideas, just, about many ideas. I want to defend many ideas here. It was not the night before that he canceled on showing up. He told him the week before, only th that became a political rally. And that the day before said, well, he's not coming. 
he had told him the week before he was not going to go. I, I just want to throw out uh, Manny Diaz. I would love to have him as a guest on our show, and we've invited him every week. And I, and I hope that at one point he does take us up on it because I think a lot of people, you know, pol on, in my table, it's politics aside and nonpartisan. Everyone is welcome here, and I would really like for people to hear. I, I want, it was I want to hear a missed yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Diaz's failure to appear was a missed opportunity. Whether he told them a week before or the day before, it doesn't matter. What he chose to do is chose to fail to appear for the largest black city in the state of Florida, which was basically to shun that crowd. So I was the perception was the perception. Yeah. That was the perception. Even if it was publicly noticed previously, you're talking in silos in Tallahassee. The average voter was unaware that it was even a thought before the legislature. So that speaks volumes to the disconnect that we have between our representatives and the community. The community definitely should have been aware so that we could have voiced our concerns initially. But Mr. Diaz had the opportunity to discuss those concerns, to highlight what we may perceive inaccurately about the standards, even though the plain language is very clear to me. You mean but those he, two words? Those two words. The plain language is very clear. Now, how they implement it, even in the original statute, I had a, a concerns when that statute first passed, right? How do you have a candid conversation about race without mentioning the words oppression? It makes no sense. But Mr. Diaz didn't appear. That was not clarified. Or he was and told not to appear. We don't know if that was his yeah. own choice or if the governor or the governor's team told him not to appear. And well, we will never know. We will never know. Well, I'm, I'm going to predict right now that other laws that were passed last year that seemed very, you know, up Vague. in the sky, nobody really paid attention. They're going to start hitting home this year because the other thing that has come up and this impacted 30,000 kids who signed up for their advanced placement psychology class learned that, oh, the college board says you can't offer it because of your, your law. And the, the rule does state no discussion of gender identity or sexual orientation K through 12. Okay. Manny Diaz said, no problem, we'll work it out. Age appropriate. That right. right. What the does that mean? We don't know. We don't know. And school districts are still confused. Yes. Yeah. All right. And we don't have to hold it here. You all are coming back for one more segment, but we have to take a break. But up next, and then there were two, another Florida state attorney suddenly suspended by the governor. Is that punishment or is it politics? We'll discuss. Stay tuned. We are back with the round table, and before we end this program, we really need to talk about uh, the second suspension in a year, or maybe a year and a week, mm -hmm. of a state attorney in Florida, Monique Worrell, who oversees the state attorney for Orange and Osceola County, suspended by the governor for neglect of duty and for endangering the public. Uh, and yeah, I guess with Florida politics, you cover exactly these processes. Um, taken out, a uh, state attorney taken out by the governor because he thinks she's not enforcing Florida law. It is that kosher? Well, the thing that stands out about this is that no governor in recent memory has used his authority to take elected officials out quite like Governor DeSantis. Normally, it's a criminal situation when people get removed from office. I think I read that Governor Scott used his discretion once to take out someone who had he had policy and political differences with, but we've seen it quite a few times with Governor DeSantis, and some people say, hey, you know, the mechanism for removing someone, an official who's not doing their duty, is the ballot box, and this state attorney that was removed was up for re-election. She had filed for re-election. A, a Democrat. Yes, a Democrat. Say. And I will say, I also should note that there were only six, there were only six um, Democrats that were in state attorney's offices. Two, two of them are in Central Florida. Yes. I mean, sorry, South right. Florida. Uh, and Ma Mary Lee, I, want, I just want to bring you in. I, I'm going to guess that you thought this was an appropriate move. Yes. And why not let voters decide they will decide um, at the next election that they, they can try to vote uh, for the same uh, person again. But he put another African-American in her place. And the fact is, a person cannot say, I'm not going to follow these laws. 
the governor has a duty, a constitutional obligation to remove from office people that are not doing their job. But you know what I thought was really interesting is that she she kind of is doing her job and and the things that the governor was citing like bond for a certain defendant or you know somebody cycling through the system that's not a prosecutor issue right that's a not at judge. All. Some of them was so a judge decision. There right. was a right. lot of overlap so if you look at the executive order so to say that she wasn't doing her duty is completely misleading right the executive order enumerates that she didn't uh, implement mandatory sentences for criminals habitual c criminals that's not a prosecutor's discretion. The judge, the judge makes yeah. the final determination there. And when we talk about these issues being addressed at the ballot box, it's important to note that she won her election by 65.7% of the vote, right? Yes. And she was up, she is up for re-election. So if the, the constituents of Orange County had an issue with Ms. Morrell, they would have voted her out. So but there, there is a concern, a growing concern amongst a large percentage of the population in our state that we see what goes on in northern cities and western cities about prosecutors gone rogue. San Francisco, you know, had an extreme left wing district attorney who was recalled. Then the, the community turned on him and he was recalled at the ballot box. The governor has extreme powers, uh, but his powers are not absolute. And this, I think, opens up the conversation that we should, as a state, talk about whether there should be a more formal process where the governor can recommend to the Senate to remove one of these state attorneys. Or maybe in make laws that address the issues that they might have with criminal justice. Yes. Exactly. That would, that would work. So um, the uh, Senate leader in, in the uh, Florida Senate, Lauren Book, has asked the governor whether there might be other state attorneys he's thinking about suspending? There actually could be a whole sea change in terms of the state, the circuit districts because um, uh, Speaker of the House Paul Renner has asked for uh, the Supreme Court to start a committee to study do we need 20 judicial circuits. Right, so uh, we could consolidation. See, right. right. And um, that's, that's been, I hear, a bit problematic for some of the state attorneys in our neck of the woods. And it's the been bar. in yeah. the pipeline for yeah. the bar, especially. The judges are required to complete certain surveys to justify their workload. So it's a clear indication that the governor or his administration has an eye on Xing out some of these judicial circuits, which is also extremely concerning. Governor's Agreed. a busy guy. Mm -hmm. So Ron DeSantis is actually in Iowa, and he is one of the presidential contenders at the Iowa State Fair this weekend, according to the nation's first 2024 voters. But in the impromptu rapping with the crowd category, Vivek Ramaswamy and Eminem take that title. And if you all haven't seen this, we're going to um, send you to break. Do not walk away from your television. Take a look. He opens his mouth, but the words won't come out. He's joking how everybody's joking now. The clocks run out. Time's up. Over plow. Snap back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. Oh, there goes gravity. Choke. He's so mad, but he won't give up that easy. Yo, he won't laugh, but he knows his own back to these ropes. His own bad that he's choked. He don't matter, but he's broke. He's so sad that he knows when he goes back to this mobile home. That's when it's back to the lab. And he opens so rap. So he better go catch this moment. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan this QR code with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And you are such a big part of this program. We would love to hear what you think on anything you heard today or anything in the news. Connect with us really easily. Send a message to at Glenna WPLG on Twitter, Facebook, Insta, threads. Pick your poison. Thank you so much for being here with us on this Sunday. Have a beautiful day and keep in touch. <laughs>